Uh, <laughs> I have a timer over here. That I can. There it is. It's over there. Uh, I'm going to be going through this. No notes whatsoever. Uh, I'm just going to kind of go off the dome a lot with it. And I, I think I'm going to be under. I don't know. I'm probably going to like breeze through it. I'm going to have this little timer as, as to help out. But essentially, I'm going to go through my top 100 list. Um, and I'm going to just do quick, quick notes on it. Before I start with that, I do want to give a quick shout out to everybody that is supporting uh, PitchCon. We've already raised $920, which is amazing. This is just one hour in. We've already gotten uh, nearly 10% of the way there, which is fantastic. That means we are giving away our PitchCon t-shirt. Uh, two copies, actually, of the 2021 Fantasy Black Book. Uh, a CBS Commissioner League fee waived access to the Dynasty Gurus rankings, and the 2021 Baseball Forecaster from Baseball HQ. We're giving that stuff away, so make sure you do sign up on that Google form at go.rallyup.com slash pitchcon. We're so close to putting uh, giving away an athletic pre uh, subscription, so definitely, definitely, uh, hopefully by the end of this presentation, we can at least get to that $1,000 mark. If not, to that, the bat, the subscription at 1250 So really, thank you guys so much for uh, supporting Sporting PitchCon, uh, I hope I don't run out of energy. Uh, I'm going to just take a quick sip before I get going because, oh my God, how am I going to do this? I don't know. It's going to be 50 minutes, and I realize now if I do this in 50 minutes, I'm going to still have 10 minutes. <laughs> all right. <clears throat> I'm not manipulating the clock. It's 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 from vclock.com, all right? Don't worry. I would not... I can't manage manipulating the clock. Get out of here. Okay. It's 20 minutes on Zach Allen. Yeah. Place your bets now if I'm going to go under or over in the top 100. I do have a backup plan to go over the uh, – I have, like, the, a list of the guys past 100 just in case. Over. I'm going to go over. Come on. I'm not going to ramble that much. I'm going to breeze through this. It's going to be <laughs> – everyone is saying over. Just for that, I'm going to say under. Thank you so much. Pass the Lord 17. The one person that believes in me. So I can do this. We might go a little bit long in this. All right, fast. Stop that. All right. <clears throat> you guys ready? I'm not. <laughs> All right, let's go. I'm going to start the clock now. Okay, so Jacob DeGrom is number one. Obviously, he is the number one starting pitcher. 21.6% swing strike rate overall last year. Higher than any other a uh, pitcher with qualified innings since 2010. He's increased his fastball for four straight years as his velocity on that. And he actually brought it down last season as he pushed up his secondary pitches, which were so good. Team is better, more wins, better defense behind him. He is okay. And by the way, yeah, I'm doing 30 seconds per pitcher. So next, Shane Bieber is my number two because I think his repertoire is just so deep. He added a cutter last year. That is fantastic. It gets in the zone. It gets uh, swing strike rates. It reminds me of Corey Kluber. And I think his fastball command is better than what we saw from Corey Kluber as well. He's in Cleveland as well. He's going to go long. He had three complete games in 2019. That suggests to me that he can go deeper than some of these other guys. Yeah, Garrett Cole, who is the number three, because honestly, after the fastball and slider, Garrett Cole just doesn't have as deep of a repertoire as the other two guys. Changeup curveball, not as good. Sometimes he still strikes, especially that curveball. But I just don't believe that Cole has uh, the ability. He's more vulnerable is what I should say. Uh, when that fastball isn't there, he's just not as dominant as the other two guys. Really nice slider, of course, and that fastball is fantastic. But we saw it last year, and I don't know. It scares me a little bit still. You're going to get the volume. You're going to get the strikeouts. You're going to get the wins. You should feel really good with Garrett Cole. Hugh Darvish showed his upside in 2019, the second half. We didn't really know if it was going to stick, but it was a better fastball. And then, of course, then it returned in 2020. It was exactly what we wanted. Uh, he had that sub-2 ERA. It was, uh, sorry, not sub-2, but about like 201 last year, uh, 0 0.96 uh, whip. Amazing stuff. And, hey, dead and bald could actually help him because a home run issue was the main problem. He might actually be the, one of the guys that benefits the most. Lucas Giolito. Okay, he's my number five. The reason he's at number five is because of volume. 
uh, volume. You're going to get it from Lucas Giolito. 175 innings in two uh, seasons prior. I think the Chicago White Sox with Tony La Russa there is just going to let him go. Like they have three guys essentially there. Keuchel, Lynn, Giolito. They're going to go. His changeup and fastball are amazing. He goes north-south with it. Uh, the changeup goes in the heart of the plate and gets whistled all the time. Check out that Codify tweet from yesterday. It's amazing. Uh, Giolito is just a really nice floor. Not necessarily the upside of the other guys ahead uh, before him, but a uh, Giolito does have uh, that wonderful floor that you want. Oh no, I'm over. Okay, uh, we're moving on it to Aaron Nola. It's the same idea from Giolito. Uh, curveball usage went down a little bit last year, but it was the number one CSW pitch last season. Amazingly high O-swing at 58%. It's exactly what you want to see. Increase the changeup usage. Brought down the fastball a little bit. It's what you want to see. Changeup is fantastic with Aaron Nola. I think you're just going to get that volume. You're going to get really nice set of ratios and strikeouts. It's just incredibly safe. Go with Nola. Walker Bueller is a little bit better when it comes to ratios, but the volume, I don't know what's going to go on. Dodger Ritis is a thing. They just added Trevor Bauer. They have like eight starters that they could trust in that rotation. I, I just, it makes me a little bit concerned about the innings. And the workload, but the skill set is there. When Walker Buehler pitches, you're going to like it. That's why he's at number seven. I was tempted to put him at five, maybe even four, but I think all four guys above him, all, all six are going to have higher volume than him, and I don't know if the, the performance is going to be so much better to justify a higher rank. Max Scherzer, I think we're underrating him a little bit. His slider is still one of the best pitches in baseball, and I think the small sample size of last year really didn't allow Scherzer to correct himself. He's done that in multiple years. He's corrected himself over the season. I think Scherzer still has an him. I know that the age is an issue. I know the degradation is coming, but when it comes to injuries, we would normally say about 100 innings for Scherzer. He's going to go all the way through. He doesn't have any sort of cap or limitation like other guys. Don't be worried about Max Scherzer. He's going to be a rock th for you through the year, and he still has incredible swing strike rates and amazing strikeouts. Trevor Bauer, I could probably go over on him. I'm going to try not to. Look, he was using some, some substance last year. We don't really know if that's going to stick around. He's on the Dodgers now. It's, he could do a kind of five-day funky you know, uh, usage or inside that rotation, but at the end of the day, we've only seen a little bit of his success. The other guys above have a much longer history of having that success. And I think the volatility of Bauer is not getting played enough in his high ADP currently on NFBC. So I still like Bauer, but I think there's a little bit more risk than we're giving him credit. And we just don't know if he's going to be that 2.5 ERA guy or if he's going to be closer to a 4 ERA while the other ones above are not going to touch a 4 ERA. Clayton Kershaw, oh no, I'm going over. Okay, Clayton Kershaw increases velocity last year. Had an amazing season, sub sub almost sub two ERA, not the 302 uh, ERA that we saw in 2019. All the stories of him falling off are not there. Innings is the only issue, but they're going to be of quality. He's never hurt you. You're going to feel good having Clayton Kershaw. 170 innings, sure. He's going to go pretty much every five days, I think, in that Dodgers rotation. Kenta Maeda is getting undervalued. He has an amazing changeup and slider, and he reduces fastball usage. Amazing. Did not get burned on that either. The Twins let him go. They let him go deep into games. The AL Central is not as weak as we like to think, but he still gets Cleveland and the Tigers, and we don't really know how the Royals are going to go. Kenta Maeda, I know it's a small sample size, but really have the faith. There's a reason why he has these little babips. He's really good at avoiding hard contact. Trust Kenta Maeda. Zach Gallen is my boy. I mean, I'm a Gallen gal. Of course I am. This is the user to year to believe into it. He had 170 innings in 2019. He has four pitches that are effective. Change of curveball, slider, and that fastball, which I think can be even better this year. He had an amazing four-game stretch to start the year against the Padres, Dodgers, Astros, and Coors. He recovered from that five walk a game and had only won the next three games. Trust Zach Gallen. You won't regret it. Luis Castillo, an amazing changeup, of course, but the slider, I don't know if it's going to be that whiff pitch or that strike getting pitch, and his fastball gets burned a little too often. He did increase his uh, four-seamer swing strike rate to 16%, which is amazing, but his sinker gets a little hit. It's, it's weird. He had a 123 whip last year. I don't really think he's going to be an elite whip guy, and that's the problem. That's why he's not in my top 10. The sinker had a fantastic 89 WRC plus last year, but I just, I don't really know if that's going to stick. His command just isn't that great being a little bit of a slinger. So be careful with Luis Castillo. I could have put him up a little bit higher, but I think the whip is the real reason why I prevented him from going higher up. Jack Flaherty, I don't know if he's going to be in rhythm or not. Last year was a really weird rhythm season for the Cardinals as a whole. And it's just a little confusing to see, is Jack Flaherty going to be in rhythm with that fastball and slider? I don't really know. So that's the reason why he's at 14. I think Maeda Gallant a little bit more secure in how they're going to perform. But still, it's a 313 ERA with a 104 whip if you remove that one terrible day that he had last year. 
Uh, we have Brandon Woodruff. I love Brandon Woodruff. It was going 200, but he's not. The Brewers said that they were only going to throw 100 innings into everybody. 75 innings last year, which means about 175 this year, which is really good. Amazing fastball. It's going to be like mid to upper 90s. Really nice slider that's underrated because it does get constant strikes. That's a very excellent thing from Woodruff. But the changeup is a little bit volatile, and I just don't like the fact that it's only 175 innings. Still, you're going to be happy with it. He's going to get six innings often. I think they're, he's the one guy that the Brewers are going to let go a lot. Blake Snell just isn't throwing his breaking stuff in the zone often. He did in the playoffs in game six against the Dodgers, and they pulled him because whatever. But now he's in San Diego. That's a good thing. I think he can finally go six innings, as we've talked about endlessly. But the main thing you should be looking for, is he going to be throwing his slider and curveball over the plate for strikes, get that zone rate above 30%, please. And then you can, maybe you can hint at that amazing 2018 run once again. The risk is just a little too high. That's why he's at 16. Lance Lynn, very, very secure. Chicago White Sox, they're going to let him go. Tony La Russa, once again, <laughs> try to pull that, that ball away from Lance Lynn. Look, he went every single game last year above 100 pitches. He actually even threw 90 plus, I think it was like 96, 98 after five, and then came out into the six to get that quality start for you. Yes, it might be a little bit higher on the ERA side, but you'll get that in volume. You get that in whip back. You'll be really, really happy with the security of the Lance Lynn, especially now with Grandal and a winning team in Chicago as opposed to the Rangers. Tyler Glasnow, so much volatility. Look, 170 ERA in 2019. Uh, sorry, yeah, in 408 in 2020. That right there is the volatility of Glasnow. He doesn't know where it's going. Where's that fastball going? Where's that curveball going? I don't know. But he extends a lot, and that's really good. It makes a lot of deception. He does have a bit of a home run problem, by the way, on that fastball. I think the most home runs of any qualified pitcher on fastballs last season. So be careful with this. This is why he's in my tier three, because there's a lot more risk than we would like to admit. Uh, there's Carlos Carrasco, who came back in 2020, made all 12 of his starts, and looked great. You know, a 291 ERA, 121 whip, 29% strike error rate. I think that whip is going to improve this uh, future season because he had his normal uh, ups and downs. And I think in the small sample, the, the downs really overplayed a bit when it came to that whip, that slider and changeup were a little bit gone for a little while. But still, now on the Mets, winning ball club, they're going to let him go, I believe, in New York and a good defense behind him. You should be getting Carlos Carrasco. Seamus Strasburg, look, he's injured. I don't really know how uh, how he's going to pitch this year. If he's in there in spring training, monitor his velocity and make sure everything's okay. But look, when Strasburg has pitched, he has been fantastic, save for 2020 when he had to get carpal tunnel surgery. I think we're underrating Steven Strasburg. There is risk right now. That's what's making people avoid him. But once you're actually drafting in March, you'll know the story here. And I believe, if I had to guess, that Steven Strasburg will be healthy by then. Sonny Gray, I'm still on target. Sonny Gray <laughs> is, uh, look, his breaking stuff is really, really good. Slider and curveball, but it does go away at times. And I don't really love his fastball changeup combination, really four seam sinker and changeup um, that he has. We showcased itself in the final four starts of last year. It led to a 370 ERA overall when he had a 194 before then. So he's going to get a harder schedule this year. Still, I think the volume will be there in Cincinnati. About 175, maybe 185 if he stays healthy. You'll like it, but he doesn't have necessarily the ceiling, I think, for consistency through the entire season. Hyunjin Ryu is on the Blue Jays, and it's really nice to see that he had 12 starts just now uh, for them this past season. However, the Blue Jays signed him saying, hey, we only expect about 150 innings this time last year. I think we're going to see something like that, and that's the biggest problem with Ryu. He has an injury history, and I think the Blue Jays are going to play around that a bit. But look, really, really solid. Think about Kyle Hendricks and a little bit more high, uh, higher strikeout upside. Uh, added that cutter last year really, really good, or actually made it better, and that's a really good thing. Charlie Morton is back for his uh, last season, essentially. I think the ADP is low because everyone didn't know if he was going to retire or not. Now he's not retiring, and it hasn't adjusted properly. You should be getting Charlie Morton everywhere. He is an ace. I mean, I think this time last year we were thinking of him like at 12 or 13. I don't think really anything has changed. I know he had got a little bit injured last year. Velocity was down. Uh, but then it got back up and he performed well in the pre in the postseason. I think Charlie Morton is one of the best values you can get in your drafts right now. Zach Wheeler, look, it's Hendricks, but slightly, slightly more uh, ceiling for your strikeouts. His fastball is amazing, and that's why we saw uh, a 294 uh, ERA last year. I think it was 294, something like just sub three ERA. Uh, now, last year's 117 whip, I think, can be improved upon. Uh, I think it's just really focus on that slider, and hopefully, he can get the most out of it this season. But look, the Phillies are going to let him do it. He's going to get the volume, and that's what you want to see. Uh, Wheeler is a really, really nice floor play here in the middle of the 20s. 
Uh, you have Kyle Hendricks. Of course, I mentioned him like four times already. David Ross let him go, and that's a really good thing. His IPS went way up last year. I think you're going to see close to 200 innings. I mean, I have 190 in my reluctant projections. He increased his curveball usage last season. He's still going to be like a 20% strikeout guy. And we really, really cross our fingers that this isn't the year that just kind of falls apart. I don't think it is. I think he's kind of here to stay for a couple more years. You'll feel really good drafting Kyle Hendricks. But because he is locked at that 20% strikeout rate, I am favoring a couple guys ahead of him. Max Freed. Max Freed is, is like really good, but he doesn't have that pitch to turn him into a strikeout guy. You know, his, his slider is a money pitch to Ching, but it's not a 20% swing strike rate pitch, and the curveball has been too inconsistent to really turn into it himself. Four-seamer maybe could be an elevated strikeout offering. I don't think his command is that good. Uh, like Kyle Hendricks, for example, and I even would say Wheeler have better command than Max Fried does, and that's the biggest limitation. Hopefully he can take that next step. I'd say 2022 Max Fried will be higher on the list than 26 in the preseason. Uh, oh, I put it at 25. Sorry. Uh, Zach Greinke. Um, look, I can see the future is what I said. Uh, he has the, he'll have diminished velocity in March. And then, of course, it'll be fine again. Look, he had 86 mile per hour fastball at the beginning of the year. And then Greinke by the end at 88 and 88 and change. OK, I think that's going to happen again. He is consistent. He has one of the best CSWs and his whip. It was 113 last year. He still had a 23% strikeout rate. You're going to get the volume. It's Dusty Baker there. Just get Granky and get that value. Um, Patrick Corbin is a little bit of a controversial pick here. I understand you're worried about last year's dip in velocity. He did gain it back a little bit by the end. And look, two straight years of sub 330. ERAs with amazing whips and incredible strikeouts with 200 innings. I think you're just going to get that again with Corbin. I've lowered him a bit just because I understand the risk of last season, but we'll see how that works uh, early on. Monitor the velocity in the spring. I think Patrick Corbin is someone you're going to want to roster throughout your entire season. Zach Plesak, a lot of question marks about this. It's just eight starts last year, but I do believe that, A, the Cleveland, in Cleveland team will let him go through the year maybe around 100 innings, 180 innings or so. And second, he has such an amazing slider and changeup that he should be a solid addition through the year. Fastball was weak, but he still had success with it. And his bad season, 2019, 381 ERA, 123 whip. That's still awesome if you get just that. Corbin Burns, I know a lot of people love him. We only saw him have success for like a really small amount of time. The cutter is so good. Trust me, I get it. I, I watch it. It's amazing, especially when paired with that slider, but only 311% of the time. And his sinker, sinker is a great pitch too, but it goes too far inside too often. It's why he had a 10% walk rate. I don't think that's going away. And that whip is going to soar when that Babbitt regresses properly. So be careful with Burns. There's a lot of different paths this can go, and the risk has him all the way down to 30 for me. Denilson Lamette, talking about risk. I mean, who? how is that elbow? We don't know. Even the Padres came out yesterday and said, we don't know. So, look, his pitch is so good. That slider, the best pitch in baseball. The best pitch in baseball last year, and I really think it's going to continue that way. Fastball improved as it added a tick of velocity. But, yeah, it, it's a crazy thing. Um, I just I just don't know how much we're going to see, and that's really the biggest issue. Uh, so, all right, I'm going to move on to 32 here. Uh, Jose Barrios, another year, and I'm just going to be ranking him in the 30s. Like, he's a very nice floor I don't think he has the ability to be like a 3A rate guy. He doesn't have the ceiling of the others, but he's going to be solid for you. And it's going to be the curveball that's going to go in and out through the entire time. So, uh, oh man, Dave Martinez. Oh man, look at that. Thanks a lot, Dan. Uh, I, I knew I wasn't going to look at the comments, but there you go. Oh man, that's crazy bad. But anyway, Brios is just a solid play. You'll like the ratios and he'll get a good amount of volume. So he's here at 32. Sandy Alcantara. Oh, I love him. <laughs> Sandy Alcantara is fantastic. Uh, look, he has an amazing fastball that's going to keep his floor high uh, at, 30, at 97 miles per hour or so. And you're going to get this changeup and slider are both going to get whiffs with it. I, I think you're going to also get about 180 innings, 190 or so. And that's just really going to speak to just success. Of the, I don't know what else to say about Sandy Alcantara. I think he's really, really good. I think he's the best of the Marlins. Um, I think he's just He's just going to continue writing. Uh, he's having a fantastic season. I'm sorry. I'm losing my mind right now. Okay, I'm at 34. 34. Chris Paddock. I don't know 
if uh, if Chris Paddock is going to get his fastball yet. That's really the thing that we're relying on here. I have a good feeling that he would. If you had to tell me, is he or is he not? I would say, yes, Chris Paddock is going to get that fastball back like he had in 2019. It was gone in 2020. He still has that Vulcan change that was just as good as it was in 2019, which is not what you normally see. Normally, you see some more volatility. It's good to see that consistency. Maybe he gets a curveball back. Uh, I think there is stuff to like about Chris Paddock, and I think he will help more than hurt. Uh, Ian Anderson. I am so excited about Ian Anderson. Man, he is... He has such a good approach north-south with that fastball changeup. does remind me of Lucas Giolito, and that curveball is there to get strikes. It's a tight curveball, not a big, loopy one. I think that's going to be an effective pitch. You could see that develop through the season. Uh, the Braves are probably going to limit him to some degree, so don't expect the same volume of other guys, but I think this will be a very good play for you. I wonder where, how the walk rate's going to go, though. He doesn't give in to batters, and that's why he saw that walk rate. Uh, maybe he can be a little bit more consistent with it this year. Frankie Montas, yeah, he has COVID. I understand uh, that is a little bit of a worry. Uh, we want him to have that healthy offseason to get back to where he was in 2019. But he's still fantastic. You know, when we saw the start of 2020 and then he had the back injury and that's when it all fell apart. Healthy Frankie Montas with that slider and those fastballs and that's uh, with that splitter rather and the slider to get strikes. I think he's a very good asset. I think he's someone that the athletics will rely on a lot this season. And so Lazardo, though, it, it's a very weird situation where you have two really good whiff pitches in your changeup and your slider, but it did get beat up a little bit more than I would like. Had a 127 whip last season. That's not really what you want to see. And not to mention his fastball, it's not going to have a .034 BABIP as it did last year. So sinker isn't very good. Uh, Four-seamer, yeah, I don't think it's going to perform as well as it did. There's still a lot left to do with Luzardo. I think he has a very high ceiling, but I think we're relying a little bit too much on him acting uh, at that ceiling too early. And not to mention the innings are probably going to be low. Lance McCullers, man, I hope that cutter is a very good thing. Uh, I don't know if it will be. And when that curveball is gone, there's just not enough there at the moment for me to think like, oh yeah, Lance McCullers is going to be an ace all the time. Not to mention he hasn't pitched over 130 innings in the majors in a single season yet. So I'm very, very cautious about Lance McCullers, but still I recognize the upside and I really hope this is the year in a contract year. Sixo Sanchez, uh, his debut was amazing. It was really, really amazing. And then he hasn't really succeeded at the level that we want him to, right? He's had that 110 strikeout game this game after. And then what What else is there? Uh, four seamer should be thrown more often instead of that sinker. Slider isn't as consistent as I want. Changeup's really good. Really, really good. And the stuff is there. Just how much are we going to see of him? Are the Marlins going to uh, reduce his, his innings? I think 150 is probably safe. It's a very young pitcher. Hasn't gone that workload yet. Be a little bit cautious with Sixo Sanchez, but man, I would just enjoy rostering him. I'm a huge James and Tyone fan. I don't run away from this whatsoever. Uh, Tyone, like, look, you're going to get 150 innings likely this year. I know the injuries before, but he changed his mechanics. He improved them. Better arm circle. He is going four seam heavy, which I do like. I don't think they'd make that change unless they were confident that it was improving him. Slider was amazing when he adapted it in 2018. Do not neglect that. It's been about two years from Tommy John now. He's really, this is the year for him to succeed. And it's the Yankees. Like, it's going to help him out, especially with the offense behind him. Same with Corey Kluber. I, I Look, I'm willing to take the chance on Corey Kluber considering that the Yankees spent $10 million on him. I think they liked what they saw of him. Yes, there is an injury risk here, but don't forget, this guy was a legit top 10 pitcher for you and at 41 that's a place that you should be taking the chance uh, on Corey Kluber because of such a massive impact he can make you're looking at all the other guys below him no one has that ceiling that Corey Kluber does I think you should go after this one for Amber Valdez I look curveball is amazing like seriously it was so good 118 batting average allowed sinker I think overperformed a little bit he did increase his velocity last year compared to 2019 slightly but I do feel that he's kind of in the middle between the 2019 and 2020. I do like that the Astros are likely will push him a good amount, especially with Dustin Bega there, as I've said multiple times. But yeah, I don't think that Framber Valdez is as good as we saw in 2020, um, over-reliant on that curveball's performance, and there isn't really much else there. And I don't think that curveball's on the same level of Dillson Lamette's uh, breaker, so I'm a little bit cautious here on Framber Valdez. John Means, I absolutely love, though. I think if you look at the narrative of the season last year, once he finally got into rhythm, which was his final starts, he had two straight, uh, the final two games were 21 strikeouts, increased velocity in his fastball, improved its command overall as he Pull back a little bit on the boss. He's still higher than 2019. Change of which is actually as good as 2019. I think that can get there as well. While his breaking balls, oh man, his breaking balls are going to be there. I promise you, John Means' breaking balls have been developing, and I think they will be there in 2019. 
21. You want John Means on all your teams. Pablo Lopez, you guys know I love Pablo Lopez. I, I love his changeup, of course. I like his cutter that I think he can throw more so to left-handers this this season, especially good a good job throwing at glove side as well. Um, he has a fastball. He does jam, guys. I think it's a little bit too low at the moment, and I think his command needs to get slightly better on that sinker and four-seamer. Secondary pitch, that is his breaker. Not that great, but that's okay. Cutter, fastball, changeup, I think he'll be consistently good for your teams. Dylan Bundy, is it going to be 2020? I mean, keep in mind, he made this adjustment of fewer fastballs for more sliders, first pitch curveballs, everything like that, and it was really successful. In the last two starts of the year, he all of a sudden upped his fastball usage while its velocity was down, and he got rocked. It was really strange seeing that from Dylan Bundy, and we have such a small sample of his success that we have to be a little bit cautious. Don't just jump into Dylan Bundy. I recognize how good it could be. 329 ERA, 104 whip, 27% strikeout rate. But yeah, be be a little bit worrisome here about Dylan Buddy. This could fall off, and I don't like that. Uh, Aaron Savali. Ah, oh, it was so exciting seeing him perform at such a high level with no fastballs and just cutters and curveballs out of the gate last year. I think that cutter is so good, as well as that curveball, 20% swing strike rate um, and 47% zone rate. It's a really, really good pitch. I wonder if he's going to develop further with that changeup and slider to complement it. And using that sinker as a surprise pitch later in counts, I think is a really good approach. I think Aaron Savali can go deep into games and be a surprising, presently good player after, you know, he really blew up in the last start. Uh, eight earned runs that brought his ERA down 0.75 points. Joe Musgrove is moving to San Diego, and you should be excited. His September was phenomenal with CSW rates for his curveball and slider being number one and number five uh, relatively to the field. It's amazing. Yeah, I'm just excited for a full season of him. I do recognize the injury risk. That's why he's at 47. But really, this has potential of being a top 30 guy, uh, as he, we've been uh, excited about for years. So definitely consider Joe Musgrove a ton. Uh, Mike Soroka, look, if he was starting opening day, he probably would be around 30 or so. I think there's a little bit too much uh, haze about how many innings we're going to get from Soroka. Even if he does come back from injury, are the Braves going to limit him? I think they will. Uh, so and the, the strikeout rates, we don't really know if it's going to be that 25%. It's probably going to be like 20% and change, given that slider and changeup haven't really turned into whiff pitches, and he ends at bats early with fastballs. Really good command guy. He will help your team, though, and that's why he's in the top 50. Marcus Stroman, think about Soroka, more volume, but a little bit more volatility on those ratios. Uh, I really hope he can become that 25% strikeout rate guy. I uh, Really reliant on sinkers, though, for ground balls. It is a better Mets defense, which is really good. You're going to get wins as well. Uh, with that Mets offense, I, it's fun to say that. Uh, but I, I like the fact that Stroman is constantly tinkering and developing and not settling for a you know four year array or so. Never had a FIP above four, which is very good. Julio Urias, uh, man, Dodgeritis. I don't know how they're going to use Urias. And 140 innings. I think it's going to is my projection for him this year. I don't know how many how like how productive it's going to be. I, I wonder if his secondary stuff is actually big whiff pitch territory especially his breakers and that makes me hesitant to believe that he's gonna be like a 25 percent strikeout guy i hope he can be i think we all kind of see it but we haven't quite gone there yet with Urias. it makes it a little hesitant to jump in as much as other people but it still should be good ratios for you it should help you when it does but there's also a headache of dodgeritis that you got to deal with uh all right i'm taking it give me a second i'll make it up i'll make it up it's fine <laughs> Um, y'all are dope, by the way. Whew. You guys are the best. All right. I got, I got 10 seconds. Hold on. Whew. We having fun. <laughs> All right. Here we go. <clears throat> David Price. Oh, I love David Price. Uh, like, I do wonder, like, how is he going to perform now that he's coming back? Right. I don't, I don't know. I just don't know. We missed this entire season, and he had so much success before that wrist injury. We're talking like a near three ERA with a 115 whip before he got hurt in 2019, and then he got hurt, and he was just terrible after that. Like, this could be an amazing play for the Dodgers uh, and your fantasy teams with David Price, but we just don't know, and that's why he's at 51, but I want to take the chance wherever I can. Tyler Molly, um, amazing four-seamer. Slider or cutter, however you want to define it, Really good pitch, he kept at the bottom of the zone, and I think that's the hyper reliant focus, right? If he can continue doing that, we might see a breakout season from Tyler Molly, but there is a very low floor here. Um, be careful about this, he can go in and out. 
Uh, we saw that in like the twin star, he just couldn't get guys out all of a sudden when he couldn't get that slider to get strikes, and that can be a problem. So sometimes that fast was a little too hittable as well. It's a risk reward here. This is the cherry bomb play. Kevin Gaussman, he's very reliant on a splitter, but guess what? It's the most consistent splitter in baseball. And the main difference from last year is that he increases vol fastball velocity a good amount. And he had a lot better command of it, getting it up and in to right-handers. That's where you want to put it. It was really, really exciting to watch that happen. It was a weird experience as a fantasy manager, though. He, you didn't really know when to start him, and you finally got production in the last three, four starts. It might be a little bit of a turmoil dealing with Gaussman, so be, be careful. Be ready for that with him. Jordan Montgomery. Uh, it's been a while since I've been excited about Jordan Montgomery. Just kidding. Every single year I am, I guess. And look, amazing change up 25% swing strike rate last year on it. Secondary stuff is developing as well. And increased velocity as fastballs. And he's on the Yankees and he has a rotation spot. Like this is exactly the play you want to make. Tristan McKenzie, he's in Cleveland and it's... Look, he has a slider that missed more bats than I expected it to. Fastball's a little bit weird when it comes to command issues, but I think that he's going to develop through this year. He's going to get stronger and fill out as well, which makes more consistency. You can even see some extra velocity on there. And it's Cleveland to let him go. You should be taking a chance on Tristan McKenzie. Dallas Keuchel, a really, really quick one here. Uh, he's a Toby, and you're going to get really good ratios. Had a fantastic season last year. It should still be there with Yasmani Grandal there, and you have a winning ball club. Like This is just a safe, productive thing. Sure, you're not going to get strikeouts, but get someone else for that. Ron Marquez, do you want to deal with this? It's like 50% of the time. Uh, you're going to have to actually platoon him on the road versus home. Uh, and sure, he has some good home starts. Good luck figuring out which one it is because it could just blow up in your face against like the Diamondbacks and you just don't know what's going to happen. So we'll see what happens there. Uh, Jose Urquidy, though, I more likely would deal with because honestly, Urquidy had a really disruptive 2020. And now, you know, he's back in rhythm. He had COVID last year. Don't forget that. He had an oblique strain. Uh, I believe as well. So it's it's just kind of weird, and I'm willing to throw away 2020 in favor of 2019, where he has four pitches that he can confidently throw for strikes. I think this actually might be a little surprise for people. Uh, I would take the chance on Arkady. Shohei Otani is getting underrated. I don't know what's wrong with y'all. <laughs> he is so good when he pitches. Fastball performed so badly uh, when we first saw him, and I think it's going to improve this year. Like the, the Angels have accepted, yes, he's a two-way player. Go get Otani. He's just being ignored right now, and it's really silly. I think you're going to enjoy rostering Otani. James Paxton is now a Seattle Mariner. I think it's a wonderful home for him. He has been really successful. He's never had an ERA above four. He's had three consecutive seasons with a 28% strikeout rate and a sub-130 whip. Like, James Paxton is good. You might have to deal with injuries and stuff like that, but we're at the point here at 60, like, you're not, you already have your four that you're, you're strong with. Might as well get the guys that should be valuable when they pitch. Um, Chris Sale, I know the whole and neck injury probably puts him actually at the bottom of this next little mini tier. Uh, it's fine. Uh, you're going to get value with him. Make the decision to drop him later in the season. Give yourself the opportunity at least to make that choice. Draft him in your leagues. It is injury. Uh, he's Just put him in the IL spot and you'll be fine with it. He's a top five SP when he's healthy. Uh, Severino's a top 10 guy. It's the same idea. Uh, he maybe will be back sooner than Sale because of the next stuff, but really like him... Syndergaard is the same stuff. They're all filthy. Like, just get them. Just get them and, like, make the decision later on in the season uh, when you need the IL spot. Give yourself that option. No reason not to do it. Because now we have the tier of, like, I don't know if this is going to work. So at least you're going to give yourself the option before. Uh, Drew Smiley. Look, the thing about Drew Smiley is, uh, oh, I'm ahead. Oh, sweet. Drew Smiley uh, increased velocity last year. Yes, it did come down a little bit by the end, about 93 miles per hour, but still ahead of the 91 and change that he had previously. Had a 70% swing strike rate in that final start against the Padres when he had that decreased velocity. Much better curveball, much better cutter. Like, this is the guy I want to take the chance on early. Uh, Mitch Keller. Uh, Mitch Keller, like, he was throwing 94, 95 when he came back from the oblique injury. Oh, that's the who had the oblique injury, not Jose Urquidy. Sorry about that. The Pirates are going to be relying on him. They're going to need to get some innings from him. I don't know how many we're going to get. Probably like 160 or so, but it could be really, really productive. We were really excited about him this time last year. I think everything that we thought about entering 2021 is 2020 is exactly the same. Consider Mitch Keller. Zach Davies, just get him early. Like He's gained the Pirates against Mitch Keller in the first two starts. You are going to want that. It was a Vargas rule last year. It felt like one with that change because I don't think it's going to perform as well as it did in 200. He had a 200 BABIP and 20% swing strike rate on that changeup. I don't think that's going to stick, but he should still be productive at least for those first two starts, and then you can make a decision after that. This is right when you should be looking at the early schedule and planning around that. 
Tony Gonsolin. Look, I love Tony Gonsolin, but then all of a sudden Trevor Bauer was signed, and now he's the number six, and it gets really, really messy. We just don't know how many innings he's going to get. If he was on Cleveland, for example, I think Tony Gonsolin would be an absolute steal. He is such a good pitcher with an amazing slider and amazing fastball. Oh, sorry, splitter as well. Fastball's still like mid-90s or so. It's not like detrimental. It's just not great. Tony Gonsolin is a fantastic pitcher. I prefer him over Dustin May, who isn't. <laughs> well, no, no, he's a great pitcher. Uh, uses a sinker a ton. He gets those outs, but it's it's it just isn't a whiff pitch, and he doesn't have one. The cutter should be. It's like 94, but I guess it doesn't move him enough. I don't know. It's not getting the results that it should get. That's a problem. And also, it looks like Dustin May is out on, uh, I would say, Gonsolin first, then Dustin May as a starter for the Dodgers, if I had to guess. It's just a really tough situation, so I group them both together. You just don't want to deal with it, guys. Jacob Rizzi, where is he going to sign? I imagine it's going to be a place that's going to let him start constantly. Yes, he has been limited usually, but that's because the Twins didn't let him go third time through the lineup. I imagine wherever he signs, they'll let him go third time through the lineup, which is a very, very good thing. Uh, man, I am blowing past this clock. This is amazing. Uh, <laughs> I told you guys. All right. I... His splitter uh, can be there at times, but really, if you see Jacob Rizzi at the top of the zone painting it red in four seamers, that means a good, that that's exactly how he should be performing. Um, those four seamers in 2019, a thousand thrown, 15% swing strike rate with a 59 WRC plus. That's absurd, and I hope that we get to see that again. He just pretty much had a lost 2020 season. I think we've forgotten about him. You want Jacob Rizzi when he does sign. Uh, Zach Eflin, I go back and forth on this one. The curveball has been a major topic of discussion. He had it, and then he didn't, and then he had it. Like, only half of his starts did he throw it over 10% of the time last year. Like, he's talked about, I need to feel it in the bullpen before the game, before it comes in. Look, if it becomes like a 20% used pitch constantly, yes, I do align more with Michael Ahedo and his article about Heflin. Read it. It's a great one. But otherwise, it's just sinkers and sliders in the same spot uh, that is down and away from right-handers. And I think it's makes him too hittable you know he hasn't had a hit per nine under nine in his career including last season when he had that curveball bit so it's a little bit shaky and it's a reason why i don't necessarily want to trust uh zach eflin a ton now domingo Herman is somebody one i might be changing because it actually came out that davy garcia might be the front runner instead of domingo Herman. whoever it is goes right here for the most part i uh, i think Herman, if he does get his opportunities is a very good pitcher. Uh, his curveball was phenomenal. He was finding the zone at a 48% clip while also having a 20% swing strike rate. That's really, really good point. 1.89, sorry, 189 batting average allowed on that pitch. He pitches for the Yankees. A good thing because you get wins. Uh, the question is how much we're going to see of him. But you should take a shot on your drafts saying, hey, it's going to be Herman or Davey Garcia, whichever one you want. I love Davey too, honestly. But I just think it's going to be Herman, so that's why he is here. Michael Lorenzen. Oh, man. Lorenzen. He was throwing gas as a starter. Sure, you're going to see, like, the, the higher velocity because he was out of the pen. He was throwing 96 as a reliever. Uh, sorry, as a starter for five innings. I mean, amazing. 14.5% swing strike rate. And he gets to face the Pirates to start 2021. Take the chance here. He's their number five at the moment. The slider and changeup both had a 24% swing strike rate. Like, this is really, really exciting. I think you should be considering Lorenzo sure it could be really bad out of the gate and then you just drop him that's why he's at 72 but definitely monitor that if he is the starter uh for, the number five starter for the reds out of the gate he throws hard he has two really good secondary pitches like that's what we want sure sure the sinker and the the cutter get hit hard maybe he just moves away from it just as forcing a slider change up i think that would be great what are we going to make out of Eduardo Rodriguez? I don't know. I hope he's okay. Like, I really just hope he feels 100%. All the health concerns are behind him. I got to remember, though, 2019, yeah, the 381 ERA and a 133 whip. But before he had that, it was in it was August uh, 14th or 12th when that started. He had a 437 ERA or 431 ERA and a 137 whip. Like, it, he got saved by a, like a four, six game stretch or so. Uh, in August and that was it that was like the season and it's really hard as a fantasy manager when he doesn't have a good secondary pitch that he can rely on to get strikes constantly it's just his changeup and his, and his four seamer sometimes sinker gets in there which is nice but the slider slash cutter just doesn't do enough and it makes for volatility and makes me a little bit concerned about Eduardo Rodriguez uh, Brady Singer it's really two pitches uh, slider and two seamer two seamer is a really good CSW pitch but it's not a good put away pitch and he doesn't have that extra 
you know, the slider really isn't that big put away strikeout offering yet. It does make me a little bit concerned. But yeah, he does get a good amount of seam shifted wake on that two seamer. A lot of good movement on it. It does allow him to get a ton of called strikes with it. I do like Singer, uh, but I do get the feeling he might be just a Toby. And he does get the Tigers early. And that's a good thing. So take a chance on Singer. See how it goes. Um, but I get a sense that he's going to be kind of this like, I don't know. I guess I'll just go with Singer kind of pitcher as opposed to, oh my god, yeah, I've got Singer. That's great. Uh, Garrett Richards is on the Red Sox now. That's cool. Maybe we get to see 160 frames. I don't know if we do. I hope that carries the ratios that we want uh, and strikeouts that are 24.5% or so. Uh, he has a really good slider, and when he's working, it's a sinker that goes inside to right-handers and a cutter that goes inside to left-handers with that slider. So it's essentially this upside-down triangle. If you can do that with a big curveball that he throws like 5 to 10% of the time, things can be really good for Garrett Richards. Uh, but obviously there's, you know, inefficiency. There are times when he just throws too many pitches. He can't steal strikes at all with that, those fastballs. And I don't, I, I just don't know what we're going to get, especially health wise as well. So be a little bit cautious with Garrett Richards, but I want to take the chance to and see where he's at. I know it's Marco Gonzalez. Everyone loves Marco Gonzalez and I'm crazy. Look, 12 teamers. I don't think that he's that three year a guy or that sub one whip. I just really don't. I think he's had a Vargas rule last year. Um, I don't understand how his sinker performed as well as it did. I really, really don't think this is just Kyle Hendricks 2.0. Uh, I, I think he's more of that 390 ERA guy that we saw in 2019. And that, it's really just that simple. Like I, I, he had an 8%, 8.4% swing strike rate and he had a 23% K rate. It just doesn't add up. Um, I think you're going to see a more like a 20% st striker rate with like a 1-2 whip, 1-2-5. And uh, he's just a Toby. And look, I recognize that maybe I'm wrong about this one. I could easily be, but I, I'm just not going to take the chance. Uh, Andrew Heaney, uh, he's so inconsistent. When I think it's because he's a sidewinder. He doesn't get the fastball high enough and lands too middle of the plate. Change him and curveball both can be really good, but they just are too inconsistent. And he gets injured a ton. There's a huge risk here with Andrew Heaney. The schedule isn't so great. For the, uh, for the Angels either, you get the White Sox and then you get the Jays. Very good offenses there too, so it makes me a little concerned if I'm drafting Andrew Heaney. What am I going to get early? It's pretty tough uh, to endure that. But Andrew Heaney, ceiling is phenomenal, so something definitely to consider. Uh, with the, when that changeup and curveball are working, that fastball is up. Oh, it's beautiful. And you might, you might still see a 25% strikeout rate this year from Andrew Heaney. But yeah, the inconsistency is going to drive you mad. Uh, Christian Javier, I don't really know if he's that great for fantasy purposes. He had 94 miles per hour on his fastball in the debut. But then constantly in every start, he didn't have the stamina. And it would decrease and go down and go down. The breaking ball, the curveball is really nice. But I don't think he uses it the right way, and he isn't getting the mass amount of whiffs that I want. I think this is more like a Toby. I think I'm okay starting Javier at times, but I don't really think he's that big impact starter, and he just kind of is a fill-in um, that maybe, I, I don't know, I hope that it will carry on. But yeah, you're not going to get a ton of innings out of Javier this year. Chris Bassett, kind of like Marco Gonzalez. I see him as a Toby. I just don't think he's going to perform as well as he used to. He's really hyper-reliant on a sinker that gets a high CSW and tons of cold strikes, but he doesn't really have a secondary pitch outside of that that is really good. Sometimes the cutter is very good for Chris Bassett, but it's just not the overwhelming pitch we want it to be, and it just makes too small of a margin for error for me, and not to mention he has a tough uh, Astros and Dodgers uh, matchup to start the year, and you probably won't like Chris Bassett for those, so I think if you're looking for a Toby, you can find those during the season. Don't go after Bassett. Uh, I got 10 minutes left. I got this. Nate Pearson. Uh, I, look, I, I wrestled with this one because Pearson's upside is obviously really, really good. Um, throws really hard and has an amazing slider, but he's injured a lot. And we don't really know how many innings we're going to see from Nate Pearson. And that's a huge, huge concern for me. Uh, I, I just I just don't know what we're going to get out of him and if it's going to be efficient enough for us to want him consistently. Uh, Dane Dunning, uh, a lot of people like him, that 24% or 22% slider, uh, swing strike rate slider. He's going to get a lot of opportunity inside of Texas, which is really good, but that's not a very good team. You're not going to get wins with that one. And I think his stuff is okay. Like, I don't think his four-seamer is really a 13% swing strike rate. Like, I don't know if his 25% strike rate is going to exist, and I think he's more like a four ERA guy than he is something like a 3-5 or so. So really be careful with Dane Dunning. Uh, Sp Spencer turn, but look, can you just cut out his cutter? Oh, sorry, his sinker, please. He has a really good slider. Four-seamer is really good. Curveball can be there. And look, if you can give you four-seamer slider curveball consistently, Turnbull's cool. And he has a, his Cleveland to kick it off, which is very good. I, I am okay taking a chance early on Turnbull and just seeing the sinkers there. But even if it isn't there that first game, is it not going to be there the next game? I don't know. I, I really just don't know. So uh, it's a little bit, it's going to be weird dealing with Turnbull this season. Ryan Yarbrough has not had a whip under 
above 130, which is really good. He's got this nice curveball, sorry, cutter and changeup to get strikes consistently. And the fact that they need him to be a true starter now is just Archer and Glass now, really. And Rich Hill, like, you need Yarbrough to get some innings there. You're going to see that with Yarbrough this year. Uh, he kind of is like a Kyle Hendricks in this way. He throws really soft and stuff. I, I think it's like a 20% strikeout rate, though. And I don't think we're really going to see those seven-inning gems that we saw in the middle of 2019 again from Yarbrough. So I think I'd just rather not deal with it than, uh, than chase him. Uh, Caleb Smith, though. Hi. What's up? You got the increased velocity in that first start last year that we were waiting for this past season, but then you got COVID and the whole thing was just like a lost season. It was it was really crazy. Nearly 50 games, 50 days between his first start of the year and the second one. Absolutely crazy. He has a rotation spot right now. The velocity is there. At least we saw it last year. I think it will be this year. This is really, really fun. I'm telling you guys, it was not like the top 50 or something like that. This is 84. Take a chance on Caleb Smith. I think he can really impress you with an amazing slider and changeup as well. Kopech probably will drop down a little bit now. There's more confirmation coming out that Kopech is going to start the, the year in the minors with Rodon being in the rotation spot firmly. Still, I think the ceiling of Kopech is really, really high. Throws upper 90s. Has a has a solid slider and changeup as well. And the second he does come up for the White Sox, I think they're just going to let him go. Uh, there is a lot of volatility inside the rotation too with Rodon with Dylan Cease as well. So you might see Kopech come in relatively early in the year. If I'm going to sash anyone, honestly, that is a prospect. Sorry, Andy Pan. It is Michael Kopech for me. So definitely consider this uh, Kopech uh, early, or at least, you know, the late round of your drafts, and then make the decision to drop him later if you want. AJ Puck uh, is number two for me here. I just don't know how they're going to do it. Now, they did just sign Trevor Rosenthal, and they have Jake Diekman as their closers. So maybe Puck does fight into being a six-man rotation for the Athletics. We will find out more in spring training. Just be cautious of him. Uh, near 100 miles per hour at times on that fastball with a really, really good slider. Uh, that just plays. All you need is that. And AJ Puck can provide that. So very interesting player here. Don't forget about him with his injuries and stuff. This might be the year we start to see AJ Puck maybe in the rotation. Alec Mills, look, he gets the Pirates twice to start the year. Like, I don't think that Alec Mills is just going to be this consistent, amazing player for the year. But you are going to want to start him for those first two starts. And then just kind of take it from there. He's not going to, you're not going to start him against Atlanta and the Mets after. So... Don't really last farther than that. But, hey, that's two productive starts to kick off the year while you monitor everything else. I'll take that. Uh, Jay Happ for the Twins. Look, Jay Happ is actually kind of solid. Like, he's always kind of been good. 365, uh, 365 ERAs and 130 whips, essentially, since 2015. He, he's on the Twins now. He's going to get some wins with that. He's just he's a nice little Toby, essentially. Brewers and Mariners start the season. That's good. I'll take him for the Brewers and see where we go from there. Mike Meyer, same idea. He gets the Rangers first, and this is a Toby, essentially. I mean, he actually has the ceiling of a 200 strikeout season. He did it in 2019. I think the Royals are going to lean on him a lot. Maybe we see that slider actually being a good pitch, while the changeup and fastball were a really nice combination in 2019. Took a small step back with them last year, but there's a chance that this actually uh, is a solid year for Mike Miner, and there might be some value here. Michael Pineda. Oh, man. So he is the number five still for the Tigers, which is nice. Sorry, Robbie, Robbie Dobnak. Randy Dobnak, you're not uh, in the rotation anymore. But Pineda, uh, he's going to get a nice cushy start at the beginning of the year. I believe it's against the Tigers. Uh, but it is a nice start at the beginning. Yes, against the Tigers. Uh, it's a really good slider. It's going to miss bats. We saw it last year. I feel like it's going to blow up a lot through the season. But to start it off, why not take a chance on Michael Pineda? Sean Manaya, uh, look, I feel like he shoves the ball. Like, he just pushes it out. It's not like a smooth, okay, I'm going to be throwing 91 constantly. His velocity dropped last year. There's a lot of injury concerns as well. I don't think his slider or changeup with this big whiff pitches either. So we saw that really small sample in 2019 when he came back from injury. And those five stars had a 27% strikeout rate. That's not Sean Manaya. 20% or so. He's really a Toby at heart who isn't going to get the 200 innings or so because he's going to be injured. And maybe, as I mentioned before, there's a six-man rotation for the athletics. So Sean Manaya, not on my list. Uh, I, I feel like you're shooting for a Toby, essentially. You're not really going to get that three ARA, 110 whip or something like that. Uh, from him so I, I'm, I'm staying away there Matthew Boyd I I love Matthew Boyd I just recognize that we have no idea how this is going to go and here's the problem he gets Cleveland first I kind of want to wait a start before I trust Matthew Boyd and then after that it's Minnesota and then it's Houston and then it's Oakland so if it was an easy schedule for Boyd to start the year I'd be all over this but the problem is as a fantasy manager you're going to feel so cautious for the first month first four weeks and I don't want that experience as a fantasy manager. So he's being pushed down. But look, 
changeup was really good last year. We were really excited about that development this time last year. The problem was the slider was gone, and he was hurt during that time. So maybe the slider does come back. It should. Fastball velocity was about the same or so. Maybe he can get that back up again too. But I, I feel like Matthew Boyd has the three-pitch mix now that he wants and maybe healthy. But if you're willing to sit through those first three starts or first four or so, you might be rewarded through the entirety of the year. Dylan Cease, I don't know where he's at. Like, is his are his mechanics fixed? Are they not? I don't know. I uh, look, he's not a 15% swing strike rate guy, or sorry, strikeout guy. He's more like a 25% when all is said and done. Hopefully, he makes those tweaks. We just don't know where he's at right now. It's in a, it's a stash. I'm not starting him at the first one. He's just a lottery ticket. But hopefully, this does work out. Carlos Martinez, same kind of idea. Like, Carlos Martinez was like one of those most consistent starters for your fantasy team and then he hasn't really been a starter since 2017 last year he had covid and an oblique strain which explains why he had a sub 94 mile per hour fastball after showcasing 95 and 96 now he's a starter he's in there he has the summer or sorry the, the the winter to prepare for this this might be a really sneaky play for the cardinals who actually are really competitive right now they could be winning the central so you might be relying on carlos martinez a lot there anthony escofani he's now on the uh, sorry uh this should be no this should be griffin canning all right i'm just gonna say it's griffin canning uh is it no i oh no oh no oh no 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 it's fine just saying it's griffin canning griffin canning has so much potential i think he's just too injured and that's the problem we didn't really see consistency with his pitches with slider fastball curveball last year um the plasma injection doesn't is a short-term solution i'd be very very cautious with that anthony descofani i uh, look he's now on the giants which is really exciting i uh, he had a 120 whip in 2019 and then it kind of fell apart for the lost season in 2020 i think he has a fastball and a slider that really works uh fastball get, gets a little bit better he doesn't really have much outside of that and when he does rely on that slider a lot it does it does work a lot at times uh it, this might work as a sneaky stream here and there uh you say kikuchi man i'm off by a number now okay this is fine kikuchi look i love that upside he increases velocity he has that cutter that is a really really effective pitch now but it wasn't consistent whatsoever and i just don't know if that's going to happen now his early schedule are the giants twins astros red Sox. like i just want to wait and see you know, I, I think this could be a nice June ad or so, but right now it's just too much. Uh, Nathan Uvaldi, I got to go quickly. Uh, I, I think there's still stuff in the tank for Nathan Uvaldi. He has, he's still throwing exceptional velocity. A uh, splitter kind of improved, and his cutter is really, really nice. He saw whiff gains in both that splitter and cutter. Don't rule him out for the Red Sox. That is a good offense, and that should be beneficial for your team. There's Griffin Canning. Well, whatever. Uh, Adrian Hauser, don't forget him either. In 2019, he had 111 innings of a 1-2-4 whip, 25% 25 stri strikeout rate, and 372 ERA. 2020 is weird. Maybe he's not going to get camp counseled or so. And last year, even his, his four-seamer had the 12% swing strike rates. It also allowed a 381 average. So it had two, 207 average in 2019. Don't rule it out. I don't expect a ton of innings, but there might be some sneaky value here in Adrian Hauser. And last but not least... We have Tanner Hawk. Look, Tanner Hawk has an amazing slider. It's a really, really amazing pitch. It's why he had a 25% strikeout campaign last year without season crushing ratios. I, I think there's something here. And he gets, he might get the Orioles early, not the Razor Twins. So uh, we'll see how that works. Yeah, I might have to wait after that. But I think Tanner Hawk is someone to definitely consider. And look at that. I did it in time. I did it in time. Yes. Yes. I don't know if you can hear it. I did it. I did it. Oh, man. All right. Four seconds to spare. Oh, okay. So I am going to actually go through. Uh, you guys can ask any quick questions you not you have. I've got about five minutes left. I'm going to uh, just look at the 101 to 200. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I could have gone on with a lot of other guys. I, uh, but I, uh, oh man. All right. I, uh, so Dean Kramer was right after that. Uh, Dean Kramer, I kind of like his stuff, by the way. I uh, throws decently hard, has a really nice cutter and curveball combination. Um, I think the, oh, the curveball is more of it to get strikes. Cutter can get a lot of whiffs. It's just the problem is the early schedule. And that's kind of annoying uh, right away, but definitely keep your eye on him. Eliezer Hernandez was 102. Uh, Alligator, I think, is really good. Really good slider. I don't think his fastball is that good, though. It's like 91 miles per hour. You can get very burned on it. And there isn't much else. So the problem here is that you don't know how many innings he's going to go. He's going to get very, be very inefficient, I believe, 
And I think there will be times when you want to start Eliezer, but it's just the, the ceiling isn't high enough. And I don't think the slider, you know, I call him uh, General Disarray because he's like a mini version of Professor Chaos, which is Denos and Lamette. Uh, so it's just not quite all there. Rich Hill is there at 103. How, how many innings are we going to get from Rich Hill? I don't know. I don't know whatsoever. Um, David Peterson was at 104 uh, because I think like he deserves more credit. Like he's currently the number five. He might be pushed out of that uh, if the Mets go and get another pitcher. But David Peterson's kind of good. He was doing well at the beginning of the year. Then he had uh, an injury, and then that was it. Like, and then he wasn't nearly as good after that. And then, actually, I, I'm lying about that. He had a couple uh, bad starts to begin, but then he got in rhythm by the end, 16 strikeouts and just four and runs on his final 18 frames. Uh, quick ones, J.D. Brubaker, Chris Archer. Uh, Brubaker, hey, he's good, Toby, with a really nice slider. And you might want to start him against the Cubs early. And Chris Archer, who, what is he? What are we going to get from that? All right, let's take some questions. Uh, for me guys why do you write the column when you could just do this uh well you know i uh, because i need to do all the research to teach myself stuff and i need to write twenty nine thousand words of course uh to get everything there where am i on logan webb logan webb um it's interesting so i i think he's a toby essentially by the way i always get logan allen and logan webb confused allen of course being on cleveland webb being on the giants i think he's a number five right now for the giants uh, that can be very good I feel like the occasional starts, but really, I don't think there's enough there in the repertoire to really suggest that he can be more than a streamer. So I just really wouldn't touch him in 12 teamers. If it's like an NL only league, okay, because you will get some volume from it. Uh, but he's not really someone that I, I love too much. Any chance that LAD throws uh, Bauer more than every fifth day? <laughs> I think at most it would be every fifth day. I think it's a crazy, funky idea that they would you know, have a six man, but then Bauer interrupts it. I don't think they're actually going to do that, though. I just think that it speaks too oddly to, like, Kershaw and Bueller, for example. Uh, would you handle drafting the Tobies differently in auto new league? I think I would. I uh, Because auto new leagues essentially reward innings, right? Uh, I would I would just continuously uh, reward value in that case. Uh, but, uh, but essentially, I mean, yeah, for 12-teamers, this is how I was talking about everything here. 12-teamer standard 5x5. Five five. Uh, but, yeah, auto new does reward just give me innings that don't hurt me a lot more. Uh, Bunce, <laughs> no problem. I got you, uh, Bun Singles. Um, uh, that's Jordan White, I believe. Um, Spencer Howard's not on here because I think he's not in the rotation. Matt Moore actually has it to start the year. I think that what we saw in 2020 with T Spencer Howard is not who he was. He was injured a bit. It was it was kind of just overdone. But I didn't really see the changeup slider combination that I wanted with that four seamer, and I'm 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 still a little bit uh, hesitant to jump in at Howard. But I'm very excited once he gets his first start this year. I'll be watching that a lot. Um, on Bubich, uh, I I like Bubich as a sneaky sneaky play. He wasn't a finished product last year. He got better as he went on. Uh, fastball changeup is really good at times, but man, he elevates it way too much. So the changeup doesn't quite get the down and away that we want to see. And I don't think it's good like Giolito or Ian Anderson to leave it up quite yet. He's just not a polished product yet. You know, he was rushed up through the minors. So Bubich, not so much. Weaver does have a lot of fun upside. I think he's inside this. Yeah, he's 108. Uh, so I do think that we're undervaluing Luke Weaver, but we also got to recognize that Cutter was gone. Excuse me. The cutter was gone last year. That was the reason for excitement in 2019, right during 2020. Uh, and I don't know if his fastball is going to make the adjustments not to leave in the heart of the plate as much. Uh, Shane McClanahan. Oh, man, I really wish he is a good long-term starting pitcher, but it's the Rays, and they have so many options. And, like, what are we going to do uh, with that one? Um, I got one more minute here. Um, let's see. Assume the Rays lose Hill and our World Series. Uh, da -da -da -da. Where does he debut on the list? And McCann McC McClanahan gets the call. Probably not too high because I don't know how – like, even if he gets the call, then is he going to be actually starting? Probably not. He'll have an opener. Then it's going to be like four innings or so. It, it, I'm going to be hesitant jumping into the McClanahan train until he's definitively a starter for them. You know, as Brubaker at 78, oh, I love it. I think he's so underrated. I really, I, I think he is. I mean, I think the, the ceiling is limited because the strikeouts won't be there. And there's still a little bit of confusion about, like, is he able to be so effective getting ground balls all the time with, with sinkers? I don't know. But I think that's a really good call.